It is so good to see you in this new week. Amen? Amen. So this evening, I want to ask you to do something with me. Are you up to it? Yeah? Or you want to know what it is first? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to ask you to do it. So you've been sitting for a little while, and I want us to play a game that you've played, you know, wherever you come from. And this is a very diverse audience, but here's the catch. You have to do what I tell you to do the way that I tell you to do it. Okay? You still game? Mm. My friend here is like, nope. Absolutely not, but we're gonna do it because it's a summer illustration. So, you remember this game we used to play as children called Simon Says? Yes! So how do you get out in Simon Says? If you follow an instruction that Simon didn't say, would it make you feel better if I said Moses said? Or Joshua said, or Abraham said, would that feel more kosher? We're gonna stick with Simon. It's all right. Okay, so Simon says, stand to your feet. Simon says, raise your arms over your head. Simon says, reach as far up as you can. Reach up. Simon says, take in a deep breath. Simon says, let it out. Now, Simon says... Take one step to your right. Simon says, stretch your arms out. Don't hit the person next to you. If you need some space, step out some more. Simon says you can take the steps to make yourself have enough space. So spread yourself out. Spread yourself. Simon says, spread yourself out. That's what Simon says. Okay. All right, Simon wants you to do one more time. Take another deep breath. This time, though, I want you to follow what I'm doing. You're going to do this. And exhale. Simon says, do it again. And exhale, Simon says. Simon says, sit down. See? It wasn't that bad, was it? How many of you really didn't want to play Simon Says? Didn't want to do it. Now, notice that what Simon asked you to do was actually helpful for your circulation because you've been sitting for quite a while, right? So that was very helpful for your circulation. Now, if I really was going to play the game with you, I would have said sit down without saying Simon Says, right? I would have had you do something outlandish. And some of you would have gotten it because you're paying attention, and some of you would not have gotten it because you weren't paying that much attention and you were just used to following instruction. Tonight I want to talk to you on the topic of following the leader. Following the leader, okay? So I want to invite you, we're going to take a detour tonight. Instead of going to the book of John, I want to ask you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 4. And when you found Matthew 4, I want to invite you to stand to your feet with me, and we're going to read the scriptures tonight, Matthew, chapter 4. When you found it, please stand to your feet. And we're going to read verses 18 through 22. When you found it, please stand to your feet, and let's read together. Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Does that mean the rest of you don't have your Bibles? All right. Matthew 18, Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22. Please join me in standing when we hear the word of God being read. And I'm going to read to you from the New American Standard Bible, and it says, As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish. Fi I'll make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. 
immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Let's pray together. Father, we come tonight just to linger a little bit more in your presence, in, our, in the family of God. And God, we want to follow you, and we can only follow you if you help us. And so we come tonight asking for the outpouring of your spirit to speak a word to our hearts and not only speak to us, God, but also equip us with the ability to say yes to you, not only tonight, but every day for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Follow the leader. As we have been talking these past few times we've gathered in this room about Jesus, um, the subject that we have been looking at Jesus under is that it all started with him. And we started by saying that this Jesus who we are following, that he is the beginning of everything. And when we looked at John chapter 1, we said, first things first, it's all about Jesus, just Jesus. The plan of salvation, the relationship with humanity, it is God initiated and it is God led. Then we talked about the fact that this invitation to be in relationship with God moves us from being enemies of God, slaves to sin, to being members of the family of God and also friends of God. This morning we talked about the fact that there is one plan. There are no contingencies. There are no backups. There's simply one plan that God has in place. And this plan rescues us from the clutches of Satan redeems us from sin and transforms us so that we can be more like God. Tonight, as we look at this invitation that Jesus extends to these fishermen, brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, also lovingly known as the sons of Th son Thunder, the sons of Zebedee, there are two things that I want to talk to you about tonight when we look at this invitation that Jesus gives these men. Picture in your mind's eye two big boats on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has been recently baptized by his cousin, John. He walks along on the side of Galilee River, see, and he sees Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and he says to them, hey, come, follow me. And immediately, the text says, they drop their nets, they get off of their boats, and they go and follow Jesus. He walks a little further down, and he sees James and John on their father's boat, and he says the same thing. Come, follow me. And immediately, they leave their nets, they leave their boat, they leave their father, and they follow Jesus. What is significant about the interaction between Jesus' invitation and these men's response. I'm glad you asked. Here's what's significant about it. Number one, when you read this text, you might think that these men had no idea who Jesus was. But when you look in all three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which we call the synoptics, you discover that when Jesus was baptized by his brother and begins to preach all around Galilee, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that these young men, Matthew, um, James and John, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, had actually been listening to the preaching of John the baptizer, so that when Jesus shows up, because John has done the work that he's been called to do, which is to prepare the way for the Messiah, Jesus coming and calling them made sense to them because they had heard John declare here is the Messiah, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So you know how sometimes when we read Scripture, we go, man, those guys were amazing. They were so faithful. They were so trusting. Like they didn't even question anything. Jesus shows up and they go, all right, let's go. But no, it wasn't some miracle. God had been setting the stage for these men lives to interact with the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. 
So when Jesus invites Simon, Peter, and Andrew to come and follow him, he doesn't tell them how he's going to make them fish for people. He just simply extends an invitation and asks these men to come, and they come. Now, what are these men leaving behind? What are they leaving behind? Employment, right? What did these men know how to do? Fish. They could do that with their eyes closed. As a matter of fact, on more than one occasion, Jesus told them to fish at the time when they weren't supposed to fish, and Peter reminded Jesus that what he didn't know how to do was fish. He said, uh, Master, uh, well, you know we've been doing this all night, and we didn't catch any fish. So no, we're not going to, no, I don't, I don't think you know what you're talking about. You can teach people and you can heal people, but you can't fish. And wasn't Peter confounded? Yes, he was. Peter was obedient, and he couldn't even hold on to the amount of fish that jumped into the nets, <laughs> right? So Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were fishermen. They knew their craft. They could smell the wind and tell you how fast the storm was going to come. They could look at a sunrise or a sunset, and they could tell you what kind of day was ahead of us. They knew the best places to catch fish. And Jesus simply says to them, what I want you to do is come, follow me, and I'm going to have you fish for people. So guess what? Maybe they wanted a vacation. Maybe they wanted a break or a change of scenery. Maybe they just understood that something was about to happen and they didn't want to be left out. What do they call that thing, Moy? They had FOMO, fear of missing out. They just wanted to know what was happening. They wanted to be able to take pictures and post it on Instagram. They wanted to be able to be there to tell their friends on Facebook, look who we're hanging with. They wanted to take selfies. Maybe that's what they wanted to do. But let me tell you what they were doing when they left. When those four men walked away from their fishing boats, what they were doing was walking away from a sure thing. Because they knew how to fish. They knew where to fish. They knew when to fish. But when Jesus said to them, come, follow me, they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know how to do what it was he was inviting them to do. And yet they went. They went. Let me tell you what else those men did. James and John, they were on their daddy's fishing boat. Which means those boys didn't have a fishing boat of their own. So they were working on their daddy's property, hoping someday what would happen? They would inherit daddy's boat unless they were able to pull enough money together to buy their own boat. So when those men walk away from their father and they say, bye, dad, see you later, we're going to go fish for people. What they're saying is, I don't want a guarantee of my future, Jesus. I'm willing to see what happens. Sounds good, huh, doesn't it? Sounds good for them, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Been fishing lately? Volunteering to go fishing lately? Uh, no. When Jesus calls, he expects us to come. It's not good enough for us just to sing songs about following Jesus from the hymnal, or from the contemporary catalog of songs. It's not good enough just to show up for worship on Sabbath morning. Prayerfully, you make it to Sabbath school. Hey! But you definitely will make it there in time for service. It is not just enough to know the right day to have the right doctrine, to be able to interpret the signs of the times. And those things are important, my friends. They're important, but they are no more important than following the leader. And the last time I checked, the leader of this ship of Zion, his name was Jesus. And if you're following somebody else other than Jesus, you're on the wrong boat. And if anyone is inviting you to follow somebody else but Jesus, you may need to take them aside and pray with them 
open up the Bible and show them that there is one leader that we follow, and his name is Jesus. So we sing songs that declare that we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We this morning together prayed a prayer that said, God, you are in charge and we want to follow you where you want to go. But the truth of the matter is this. We want to follow on our own terms. So I'm reading this book because my boss asked me to read it. Um, and he, he often recommends good books, and it's actually not my immediate boss, it's the boss of a boss. But I thought I would read a section of it to you because it fits in with what we're talking about tonight. You ready? Every Sunday, I get up in front of 500 people and find myself preaching from a fish boat to people on fish boats. It doesn't matter that we finished last Sunday committing with fresh and joyful resolve to live in the power of the resurrection and to go out into all the earth and make disciples. Sometime around Wednesday, or for some of us, between the church foyer and our parking stall, we found ourselves almost mindlessly wandering toward our fish boat, climbing on and setting sail. Why do people get close to God? Why do you? When I subject my own motives to the sharpest and roughest scrutiny, I find very often that the God I'm looking for is the God who follows me, who comes onto my fish boat, fills up my nets. But I fear the God who becomes concretely personal in Jesus, who confronts me with a stark command, barren of option, follow me. When Jesus says, come, follow me, he's not asking if you're up to it. He's not asking if it's convenient. He's not even asking if you like the invitation. He's simply saying, come, follow me. I look around this room, I see people with a lot more gray hair than I have. I have a few strands, they're coming. They're coming, I promise you, they're coming. I know they're in my future and I'm trying to embrace them. Yes, I'm looking forward to those. So I'm not going to insult you tonight and stand here and pretend that I don't know that many of you in this room have made it your life's decision and journey to follow Jesus. What I am going to confront you on tonight, though, is what does that following look like? How inconvenienced have you been? How uncomfortable have you been with this following? How uncomfortable are you about what he may ask you to do still? Do you think you've done enough and now is a good time for you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride? Can you identify for Jesus all the other people who should be doing this following? Because surely if all of them started following, There'd be less work for us to do, and more things would happen. But here's the thing about following Jesus. Following Jesus is not us asking him to do what we want to do on our terms. It's saying, I'm going to trust you even though I don't know where you're going to take me. Christian author and martyr, preacher, writer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says it this way. When Christ calls a man... He bids him come and die. Discipleship is not an offer that man makes to Christ. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. So if he says, come, follow me, what does that look like for us? What does it look like? I, you know, I work with young adults at a, at a university, yeah? You're aware? Do you, are you aware of that? I work at a university. And most of them who come to us at Loma Linda are already finished with undergrad. And um, someone made the comment, I was talking to somebody today and they were talking about students who go to Avondale, they graduate from the matrimony class, which means they actually leave Avondale with a spouse. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I heard about that. I heard about that whole plan 
that we have in our little circle of Adventists that if we want to guarantee that our children marry Adventists, we send them to an Adventist school. Yeah. What if that wasn't Jesus' plan? Ouch. That's all right. They come to our university to study and to prepare. And a lot of students come to Loma Linda because they really are drawn to our intentionality about incorporating mission and serving others in the educational process. And so that's why they come, all right? That's why they say they come to Loma Linda. So when I talk to them about the essays they wrote to get into our university, when they write these beautiful essays talking about how they want to go serve and they, and they love the values of Loma Linda and they, they want to come to chapel every week and, and they want to go to Bible study and they want, to, they want to, man, it sounds amazing until they have to do it. <sighs> Why do we have to go to chapel? I'm an adult. I don't want you telling me what I have to do when it comes to my spirituality. It's personal. I'm sorry, didn't you write an essay that you really wanted to come here because you wanted to do this? Uh, how are we supposed to go on these mission trips? We don't have time in our schedule. And others go, oh, I would love to go, but I can't stop studying because if I stop studying, I'm going to fall out of my class. I'm going to fail. And so what we find happening is what they want to do comes smack dab in confrontation with the reality of life. And what they must each do, as you and I must do, is learn to trust God. Hebrews 11:6 says, For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must what? Believe that he is God and a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Doubting and questioning is not a sin. Wondering whether or not God can do what he says he will do, that's not sin. The problem comes when we say, yes, Jesus, I will follow you, and we don't move. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Because what we're saying by our unwillingness to follow is, I know better than you do, Jesus, how to do my life. I know better than you. Why are we afraid of leaving our boats? Because it costs a lot of money for that boat, doesn't it? Didn't it? Didn't it? Your boat's not cheap. As a matter of fact, didn't Jesus help you get that boat? Amen. So then why all of a sudden would he want you to leave the boat? Doesn't he know the decorating plans you have for the boat? Doesn't he know what kind of advent adventures you're planning to go on? Didn't he see your five-year and your 10-year plan? Doesn't he know that in the next 20 years, you already have it worked out, how many trips you will take, and when you will just coast with your friends? Come on, Jesus. You just gave me the boat. What do you mean I need to leave the boat and come and follow you? But that's what he's asking us to do. But his asking us to leave the boat and follow him is not just this blind quest. It is actually to partner with him to fish for people. When James and John and Simon Peter and Andrew walk away from the boat, they're not just walking away from their father's boats or their pension plans their salaries. Can you imagine the conversation Peter had with Mrs. Peter? Babe, um, so Jesus came by the boat today, and he asked me to come follow him. So I'm leaving. Where are you going? I don't know. When are you coming back? I don't know. How are we going to eat, Peter? I don't know then I don't think you're going with Jesus. Because we would love to think that Mrs. Peter just simply said, oh, amazing, go, no questions. But I think she asked a couple of questions. Husbands, how many times have you felt motivated to do something, and by the time you worked it out and you got home and had to talk to your wife, you talked yourself out of it? Because you could just hear what she was going to say. Even if she didn't open her mouth, she just looked at you. 
right? And you were like, nope, that's not going to fly. Right? How many times have we had these ideas of ministries that we wanted to do in the church, outside the walls of the church, but we already undid every dream that God gave us because we know the church board is not going to agree with us, or the elder is not going to agree with us, or pastor is going to tell us no, so we shut it down. It never sees the light of day because we are more concerned about what the people say than being willing to be obedient to the call of God. We are in the business of fishing for people, which means we must leave the boat. You got to leave the boat. You got to leave the boat. But see, what we want to do is we want to keep the boat. We want to throw the line out. We want to pull everybody onto the boat with us too. And while they're coming on the boat, we're going to clean them off. Come on, let me scale them off, Jesus. They can't come on the boat with all them scales on them. Let's... Some of them we're going to keep on the side of the boat. We're going to rub them down outside the boat before we let them on the boat. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But the command of Jesus tonight to us in Victoria is get off the boat. Walk away from the boat. Follow the leader and let him show you how to fish for people. Because if you stay on the boat, all you're going to do is mess around with dead fish. We're going to be truthful. Some of y'all are just hoping some people would leave your church. Where are they going to go? To somebody else's church? (laughs) What if we did an exchange program? (laughs) Help us, Jesus. You send us yours, and we'll, send, and we'll take yours, and we'll send you ours. I got the numbers right. In the city areas, there's one Adventist to 4,000 people. And in the rural areas, it's one to 400. Now, this might sound blasphemous to some of you, but I want you to sit with me on this one. I'm not so concerned with making people Adventists as much as I'm concerned of introducing them to Jesus. Because the testimonies we heard tonight show us that Jesus is already at work. But we sitting on the boat. Jesus, the conditions aren't appropriate. I mean, it's too hot. Jesus, it's too much work to get off this boat. Jesus, how long do I have to leave my boat again? This is not a convenient time. Could you come back to me in six months, Jesus, when everything settles down? Jesus, you know, I have these really grand plans, and while this sounds like a really great idea, and I know that you are God and you will accompany me, could you come back? Could you ask her? (laughs) Could you ask him? Come check me in six months. Jesus is saying to us, come follow me so I can make you fish for people, because the imperative is that God loves the world, and the world are the fish, and he's not only commanding fish to jump into your boat. What he's asking you and I to do is to walk away from the boat. So you might say, I'm too old. That's not true. You're not too old. There's nobody that's too old or too young to be used to fish for people. Ask the fisher, the the great fisherman himself, Jesus Christ. And there's some of you who know how to fish. You need to open a school to teach the younger ones how to fish. Amen, somebody. You know which waters are ready. You have experience that God can use to help those people who need to know him. But you must get off your boat. You got to get off the boat. So I told you the story of my mother's influence in my life and coming to join with the Seventh-day Adventist Church when I was in my teens, my late teens. And I remembered at the period of time when I joined the, 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 the church, the funny thing was I joined the choir. And how did I join the choir? It was my mom's friend that she had met 
on an assignment as a nurse. He happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And I had known about maybe five years before that that I would probably end up being Adventist or Baptist. I was just like, Jesus, that's pretty much my trajectory. I think I'm going to, I think that's the direction that I'm going. And so the Lord had it worked out that my mom meets this gentleman who is from Africa in New York. She's from Jamaica. How random can that be? Right? And he's a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And he becomes like a father to me. I was in college, had a lot of opinions, like I still do. <laughs> but I had a lot of opinions then. And he would talk with me and give me counsel when I wanted to join the military. He told me no. And I listened because he had wisdom and I wanted to, I wanted to really hear from someone other than my mother. You know what I'm talking about. Do you all remember that? Remember how you would listen to anybody but your mother? Mm-hmm. Yes. That's why I told you, you know how to fish. You know how to fish. So you should be present for those young people in your community who you see struggling with the adults in their lives. Because you know the value that came from having people around you who, who could listen to you when you were growing up. That's one of the reasons why our house is open to young adults. Because I know what it's like to have a house I could go to that was not my mother's house. I told you I wasn't always obedient. I didn't always listen. Now I can tell you that woman is amazing. But in my 20s, she's always trying to stop somebody. I don't want to hear about how many miles she had to walk to school. I don't want to hear how hard she had it. This is not, this is not Jamaica. You know, fill in your country. But I remembered giving my heart to Jesus and telling him, Jesus, I promise you, I want to follow you. And whatever you tell me you want me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get out the boat. So there was this pastor at our church, so random. Now I know it was Jesus. And um, he had all of us who, did our, who, who had gotten baptized to fill out this inventory of our spiritual gifts. This was 1987. Spiritual gifts, like who's talking about that in the 80s? They did? did? Who remembers taking inventory of spiritual gifts in the 80s? 90s. A few more hands in the aughts. No? See? Well, it felt real random to me. And I said to Jesus, Jesus! Whatever this test says that I'm supposed to do, I'm going to do it. I promise you with all my heart, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Send. We didn't even computerize. We didn't even score it on the computer. He had to score it by hand. Test results come back. You ready? Pastor. Uh, no. Jesus. No. Second one. Teacher, yes, I could do that. Dillis, you said that whatever I ask, but Jesus, you don't know these Adventist people. I'm new to Adventism, and I already know that they don't do women pastors. So I'm not doing that. But Dillis, you said, Jesus, they don't do women. So let me teach. And he let me teach for about 11 years. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I taught in a Christian school, and I said, I'm going to be an assistant principal, and then I want to be a principal, because I want to help these children learn about Jesus. I want them to help them learn how to read. I went to graduate school, and I got not one, but two master's degrees in education. Yes, I did, because I was doing what God told me. I came off the boat. Well, no, not really. I stayed on the boat. I just, you know, adopted my, adapted my boat to sail in the waters, I wanted to sail it in. I'm talking to somebody in the room tonight. Hmm. So, you know, I married my husband in between there, and I knew that Jesus told me to marry him, so I got that right. Amen. Hallelujah. I wasn't my own doing. Lord knows it wasn't my own doing. That's why on the days when I'm like, Jesus, he reminds me, yeah, I picked him for you. Oh, help me, Lord. Married people in the room, y'all laughing too hard. <laughs> and somewhere in there, 
Between years 11, 10 and 11, our lives started to change. And ours, and I'll fast forward the story to you, looks something like this. We owned a home that we were able to buy when we first got married, thanks to the help of my mother. She helped support us through that process. Our house was five blocks from our church. Why? Because my husband was the AY leader. I was teaching Sabbath school, young adult Sabbath school. A year after I got baptized, I stayed in a new believers class for a year. I thought I was going to die because I was like, how much longer to sit in a new believers class? Please, can I get out of this new believers class? So I did the year that was mandatory, which is a whole other conversation. You, we should be able to read the people's abilities and not make them do something. If you see the gifts that are there, let them loose. Amen, somebody. So I did my year in New Believers class, and then I taught the young adult Sabbath school class until I left to go to seminary. So I was teaching Sabbath school. By this, I was doing women's ministry. I was doing family life. I was a clerk. I led worship, sang on the choir. My husband was AY leader. Fed I mean, we're just, we're just like up to our eyeballs in ministry. We lived five blocks from the church so that our youth could walk to our house just in case their parents didn't want to drive them. Mm-hmm. You know, why you all have to go back to church in the afternoon? Somebody better give you a ride because I'm tired. And I understand being tired. That's why sometimes those of us who are in the church need to open our homes to young adults and youth so that parents can get a break, but so that those young people can also sit in an environment where they can ask questions and observe what discipleship and living a life following Jesus looks like. That's my plug for young adult and youth ministry. And so smack dab in the middle of that, several things happened to my husband and I at one time. Boom, first thing that happens, we have two miscarriages. In the middle of two miscarriages, our house goes into foreclosure. In the middle of that, I'm working on a graduate degree. And I remember saying to God, what is this? Don't you see me out here in my boat fishing? You said, come follow. I'm fishing. Come on, Jesus, look at me. Don't you see me? But was I really fishing? Was I? It's a question. Was I fishing? Yes. But on whose terms? My terms. I had adapted my boat. What he had asked me to do was leave my boat. And I said no. Well, between the miscarriages, the foreclosure, oh, I crashed my boss's car, her brand new car. I just said to Jesus, what do you want? Because for all these things to happen, this is not just Satan's trying to get me. This is God trying to get my attention. And he said, Dillis, leave the boat. And I said, Okay, but the man you gave me, he not leaving the boat. I'm ready. I hear you loud and clear. I'm going to leave the boat, Jesus. But this man you gave me, he not leaving the boat. And Jesus said, don't worry about him. Be obedient. And in 2002, February 25th of 2002, I told Jesus, I'm ready. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know where you're going to take me, and if I have to do it by myself, you're going to have to figure it out, but I am in, 100% in, all the way in. I'm leaving the boat. Well, Jesus had also been working on my husband. So when I say to him, honey, for real, we got to leave the boat, he goes, okay. What? Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's just do it. How are we going to make it happen? Well, what had happened, you see, was that same house that had been in foreclosure, God had given it back to us. So when I said, let's go, and he said, I'm in, we sold that house. We sold a house. Some of y'all are scared. You're like, what? You sold a house? Yes, we did. We paid off all the bills. We had one bill that we didn't pay off. And we left in a little old U-Haul, my husband, myself, and my best girlfriend. And we drove to Michigan. We didn't know what tuition cost. We didn't know where we were going to live. We had bad credit. 
But you know what it felt like to do that? Glorious! It was awesome! It was freeing! It was peaceful! Because I was no longer responsible for the boat! I didn't need to maintain the boat. I didn't need to dry dock the boat. I didn't need to rub the, the, the front of the boat. What you call that? The key? Come on, talk to me, all the boat people. Help me with the metaphor. I didn't have to put it up on anything and rub it down. I didn't have to slob a deck anymore. All I had to do was go out there and walk on that water so he could give me a new boat. And I stand here today in Australia, something I never planned to do. This is not my idea. Trust. Not my idea at all. And what do I get to do? Sing about Jesus, talk about Jesus, and encourage people to go tell others about Jesus. Simply because I finally got it through my thick head that when he says, come follow me, I don't determine how and when and why and where. I simply go. So can I tell you what Jesus did? Are y'all ready? Y'all not ready. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> I had two miscarriages. I have two children. If he never gave me one, I would still testify that he is good. I would still worship him and glorify him and I would still serve him. Because I don't do it because he gave me two. I do it because he asked me to come follow me. The house that we sold, it, wait, 2002, do the math, 2002 to 2000, what's this, 16, 15, 14, do the math. How many years? So two from 14 leaves us with? 12 years later, he gives us a better house, girl, than the one we had before. You better ask somebody. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. That's what we say in black church. Won't he do it? Y'all say, yes, he will. Won't he do it? Yes. A little practice. So what I've lost, he's returned, and then I have bonus. Every single one of you is bonus for me. Every person I get to encourage to see Jesus, to know Jesus, to follow Jesus, is the bonus. I get paid to talk about Jesus. All the time! Are you kidding me? And I look back and I say, you big dummy, what took you so long? Well, I don't want you to call yourself a dummy. All the, all the health, the mental health people are like, that's inappropriate. You do not call yourself names. I'm not a dummy. I'm disobedient. I'm afraid. I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. I'm prideful. I worry. I think I know more than God does about me. Actually, I think I know better than he does. And yet, here I stand. So friends, if we agree it all started with him, and if we agree that he has a plan, he wants you to know tonight, follow him. Get out your boat. Get out your boat. So what I want to ask you to do is to turn to the people around you, and there are two questions, or maybe one, that I want to have you ask them to pray with you about tonight. Here it is. What is the biggest challenge that you face as a follower of Christ? That's one. Second one. What's keeping you in your boat? And why do I want you to say it out loud? Because if you say it out loud, it will no longer seem like this huge specter. It actually becomes bite-sized. And since we are a family, when we share with one another, we won't gossip about what the other person says. What we're going to do tonight is pray together for one another to be willing to trust the Jesus that we read about in Scripture, the Jesus that we have personally encountered. So I want to ask you right now, take a few minutes, 
What is the biggest challenge that you're facing as a follower of Christ? And what is stopping you from getting out of your boat? Please talk to one another.